Okay, uh, so welcome back. Here we are on part two of week three, doing chapter nine, about uh, all about graphing. So it builds on some of the work we were doing in chapter three, when we were looking at formulas and solving simultaneous equations. We're also going to look at the end at a break-even analysis, just a quick introduction. So that's some of the work we'll be doing this week in class. So let's go. So graphing. Pretty simple. Look, you've, you've most likely covered it in school, so it'll be revision for you. But let's just go over it, make sure we've got the basics nailed. Um, <clears throat> I love graphs. Uh, graphs are, a, a graph is a picture, and a picture paints a thousand words. Graphs are fantastic for uh, predicting trends. You can visually see what's going on, the relationship between one variable and the other variable. Uh, so very, very helpful for uh, for us in business, engineering, medicine, trying to graph COVID. Uh, again, I don't know if you've seen some of the graphs, but a graph helps your mind get your head around the data. So what what might what might we want to graph? Uh, we might be interested in looking at uh, sales over time. Uh, height versus the relationship between height and weight, uh, profit, is there a relationship between profit and sales, graph those two over time, maybe exports and imports, expenditure and income, and as I said, possibly a medical pandemic uh, might want to be graphed as well. So the, this uh, X and Y observation, these plots on the line, are what we call ordered pairs and uh, they are normally represented by, in brackets, x comma y is the notation for those ordered pairs. And uh, pretty much we just follow that mathematical um, uh, methodology and uh, everybody understands it and follows it. Uh, what happens though, what's interesting, when we see these graphs, uh, the X value, the, the Y, when you're trying to work out, what do I put on the X? So go back to these, these sets of data here. Where does sales go and where does the year go? You'll normally, in every graph you've ever seen, time, time will be uh, on the X axis. And what we're trying to measure over time is on the Y axis. So that's the key to help you remember. Whatever we're trying to measure normally goes on the, what well, does go on the y-axis. So when it comes to height and weight, what is it that you're really trying to prove? If you're trying to prove that uh, the higher somebody is, the heavier they are, you'll put height on the x and you're trying to prove the weight. Uh, so weight would go on the y-axis. So it just depends on what it is you're trying to show. And that helps you determine you know, what, where your X and Y. Sometimes it's not that in that critical, but um, you know, mo follow those rules and you, and you should be right from here on in. More of that as we uh, cover that topic in a few weeks time. So by, by the way, the X axis then time is independent. Uh, what we're trying, and, and perhaps if we were trying to measure the, um, let's imagine one other example might be, um, a medical uh, a dose of medicine and and the effect on the patient in terms of symptoms so it's the symptoms we're trying to measure that'll go on the y and what we try to manipulate is the dosage down on the x value and see what the effect on the patient is on the y so y becomes dependent on x x, x changes we try to measure the change in y So there it is, X is horizontal, Y is vertical, and the starting point is of these, where these X and Y axis join is called the origin. And we've got to, we want to put a scale on both axes. So here we go, typical sort of points that we might want to plot, our X positive or negative and Y positive or negative. So here's a, a little formula, Y equals BX plus A. Uh, or y equals a plus bx. So b is the slope of the line. 
uh, as X changes, how much will Y change? And A is the Y intercept. Um, basically, when X equals zero, this expression here will be zero and we're left with the Y intercept. We know when X equals zero, where does the line cross? You pretty much only need, well, you not pretty much, you do only need uh, two po points to graph a straight line. So the y-intercept would be enough, the slope would be enough. And I, I should, when we get to class, I'll show you the financial calculator. It can actually calculate, it's, it's got a value for A and B uh, on the calculator. I forgot to put that in these slides. But we'll look at it when we get together in class and you'll be able to, once you know your y-intercept and what your slope is, uh, you'll be able to graph the line. Uh, some people say, um, <clears throat> you know, when, the, when you're looking at your calculator and looking at a set of d data uh, without this, it's pretty self-explanatory that the slope is the coefficient of the x value. But when you're just trying to, you've got the data and you're plotting it and you're thinking, uh, okay, I'm going to go recall A to find the y-intercept. I'm going to go recall B to find the slope. But if you got mixed up in an exam, say, and you thought, uh, which one's which? One of these, I know one of them's the slope and one of them's the intercept, just on your calculator alone, if that's all you were using. Um, I, this is where I use little memory joggers to help me, and we'll talk about this in class, but I normally come up with something like B sloping down the hill. That helps me remember that B is in fact the value of my slope. And, uh, you know, I, the intercept, why I, I think uh, I think of A intercept. Uh, I have A intercept. I don't know. But whatever memory joggers you want to use, um, that would be great. So uh, let's grab some points. Let's see what it looks like graphing the straight line. So we've got a range of ordered pairs here, and let's graph them. If they're all on the line, um, then they're all fit. They all come within this equation. And so they're all, these would all be on the line. Let's have a go. Uh, so it says when x equals 0, y equals 3. So x equals 0, there's the first point, y equals 3. As I said, we only need two points to be able to graph the line when x equals 2, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 3, y equals 7. So let's plot that in when x equals 2, y equals 7. We could pretty much, we can, sorry, I've got to stop saying pretty much. We can draw the line now, straight down. But we'll just do one more to check that we haven't made any mistakes. We'll plot one more, My x equals minus 2, y equals minus 1. x equals minus 2, y equals minus 1. Perfect. We've got our first line graphed. By now, it's probably all coming back to you. Yes, I did this in school. I remember now. So let's solve some uh, simultaneous equations using a graph. Uh, two lines crossing where they cross, where they meet. We've solved the graph. Now, you might remember from uh, our chapter three work, we just a few slides back in the earlier video, we solved this equation. Uh, this is the particular method where we decided to make six the common denominator, subtract the two equations, and we worked it back to find that y equals three, and then we put y back into the equation to find that x equals seven. So, um, but let's do, let's get let's graph those both lines and see what they look like and see in fact if that is the point where the two lines meet. So let's have a crack. There's the two original formulas: three x plus four y equals thirty-three, and two x equals you know two x minus three y equals five. And we've graphed a range of x values and we're trying to graph plot the y. And so again, when x equals uh, minus three. 3 times minus 3 is minus 9. Uh, and then we'll divide that 33. We'll end up with a value for y equals 10.5. So I'll just graph the first one, make sure it's the right one. It's this 3x. It's saying when x equals minus 3, y should equal 10.5, which it does. We'll do one more. When x equals 0, y equals 8.25. So there is the there is the y intercept 8.25 bang those two lines we graph it straight down there 
notice if we were to um, if we if we were to solve this, let's look at the value. What's happening to y as x increases? As x is increasing, y is decreasing. So we have this negative slope. It's hard to pick the slope because the coefficient here is positive. But when we rearrange, let's go and have a look. Did we rearrange the formulas this time? In one of the other slides, I'm going to jump back a few lines, just see if I can find it. When we rearranged the two formulas, is it here? Um, maybe I can't spot it as as I wanted to. Doesn't matter. Um, we'll 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 finish that off in class. Let's just jump through. We'll plot the other um, point. Uh, the, the the other line when x equaled minus five, y equaled minus five. When x equals zero, y equals minus 1.67. So as x is increasing, y is also increasing. It's a positive slope, sloping up to the right. Um, <clears throat> it's, um, if I was to, uh, just to show you, I'm, I'm trying to pick up that point that we mentioned earlier. To solve this, um, I would, if I wanted to leave y on one side of the equation, I would add 3y to both sides. When I add 3y to both sides, I basically, my equation looks like this, 3y equals 2x minus 5. So again, that lets me know the slope is positive. So it is definitely sloping up. Uh, and as we keep going, we can find that sure enough, as we solved these equations and we found that x equaled 7 and y equaled 3, sure enough, that's the point when x equaled 7, the two lines crossed when y equaled 3. That's the, the one dot that matches both lines. All the other dots say, yeah, so we found the intersection point. So helpful for solving uh, some practical problems. And one method we might want to use uh, our lines is a break-even analysis. So let's have a crack at how that works. So break-even, very simple. We, we break our costs into two types of costs. There are certain costs that no matter what the volume is or what sort of quantities are sold or what the level of activity is. So um, let's imagine it's a bus company and or a, a boat that's going out to do whale, whale trips, whatever it is, or a doctor, the number of patients. But let's go to the bus company. Uh, there'll be certain costs like the the rent of the, um, not the warehouse, but the facility where the buses are garaged. Um, anyway, um, the, the uh, rego on the bus, uh, whether the, the bus does one kilometre or 50,000 kilometres, that rego is a flat fixed cost depreciation. So these sorts of costs uh, aren't going to change, perhaps. We've got some, um, yeah, fixed costs in total. They won't change. Uh, interestingly, when you come to management accounting, the cost per unit drops for fixed costs. More of that later. Um, variable costs will go up with, so normally labour materials are variable. The more you produce, the more labour you use, the more you know, and the more materials you use. So we break our costs into those two component parts and we say total cost is made up of both of those elements. And so it ends up looking like a straight, the cost, total cost curve, if you like, is our straight line where the variable cost becomes the slope, the coefficient. Um, and the uh, fixed cost becomes the y-intercept. When we produce nothing, we're still going to have to cover these fixed costs. So where, do, where does it cross? the y-intercept. The fixed cost curve will be a straight line. No matter what the volume is, it's a flat line across a, um, it is a horizontal line parallel to the x-axis. Okay, so there's all our variables. We put it together and we've worked out that revenue, if you like, total revenue is made up of the selling price per unit times the number of units. 
and the profit simply the total revenue minus the total costs and if we somehow end up with a negative here we've got a loss of course when costs are greater than revenue so let's have a look at uh, we're finishing up now this video with this example uh, let's have a crack uh, we're making a calculator fixed costs are estimated to be five hundred dollars a variable cost of $8 per calculator and the selling price per calculator $12. So we've got the three variables. It says find the total cost when we make 80 calculators, find the total income at 80 calculators, find the profit or loss at 80 calculators, and try and work out where the break even point is using a graph. So let's have a crack at doing that. Pretty much, we just got to plug in the data. So let's do that. Costs equals $8 per unit times the number of units we were told in the question we're making and producing 80. So 8 times 80, that'll be my total variable cost plus my fixed cost of $500. I think that is a typo. Anyway, $500. There's my total cost, $1,140. Okay, let's work out what the total income is. Selling price, $12 times the number of Quantity sold 80 equals 960. Unfortunately, costs are more than my revenue. I've made a loss. Let's have a look. Revenue 960 minus total cost 1140, $180 loss. Now we want to work out where is the break even point. So we could, let's plot the two points. And uh, basically, you'll see that the revenue curve has got a higher slope. Uh, y is going up for every X unit we sell, um, dollars generated is going up by 12. The variable cost is a, a smaller slope, only eight. It's only going up by $8 for every unit we sell. So that's the reason it's a flatter line, if you like. So when we, the revenue curve, when we sell nothing, we make nothing. So zero quantity sold, sold zero. We sell one, uh, we sell, what is it, $12. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, 12, $12 for every unit we sell. If we sell 12, 12 12s, uh, 144. So that would, that would be roughly that point there. We just keep, we've just got to, depending on how accurate your scale is, just keep working it through. And it looks like when we sold 125, 125 lots of 12 equals 1500. So we'll join that dot there. We, we really only needed the, um, the y-intercept. There was no y, y-intercept when x equals zero, y equals zero. So it, that's why it's starting there. We sell nothing. So we start there. We've got, we only need one other point to draw the line. And so we draw out the revenue curve. Let's do the same with the cost curve. Notice fixed costs stay fixed, $500, no matter what the level of the activity is. So there's my fixed cost curve. On top of that, I'm going to place my variable cost curve. And so my total cost curve looks like that. And it is, again, the same sort of deal. Fifth, when we sold 50, it was 50 times 8 plus 500 to find that point there. And we keep going. And when we found, just so happened, say 125 times 8 plus 500, we've, got, we've found the point at which we break even. We could put it back in the, the equations in the formula and we would prove that that is, in fact, correct. Our graphing skills are perfect, that we've found the break-even point. So all below 125 units, costs are greater than revenue. We're making a loss at this point. We've covered our fixed costs, and anything beyond that is we're starting to generate profits. Revenue curve is going to climb higher than the total cost curve. And where the beauty of a graph is we can read off if this went further, we always like to make sure my break-even point is right in the middle of my graph because then we can see the, the, the loss and the, and the revenue and we can measure off different scenarios for, hey, what if, we, you know, what if we sold this many? What's our profit going to be? So a bit of a rough graph here. 
we'll do better ones when we get together in class. Interestingly enough, the point is we really know we've broken even when we've covered our fixed costs. So the real break even point formula when we come to do uh, that um, topic in full uh, will be uh, fixed costs. We've got to cover those. And how do we cover it? Well, for every item we sell, the contribution margin, every unit we sell, we've got a $12 revenue minus the $8 variable cost. So every unit we sell, $4 is contributing towards covering the fixed costs. 500 divided by four gives me my break even point, 125 units. So I think, yes, that is all we need to know. Quick intro for chapter three and chapter nine. Uh, looking forward to catching up with you in class and uh, we'll solve a fair few practical problems very similar to this.